Hey everyone, welcome back to the Dabbler's Den. This is Chris Cottrell with part five of my presentation on Carolina Bay Formation. Uh, before we get started, uh, I want to go ahead and thank everyone who subscribed and left comments uh, over the past few weeks. Uh, when I first started this project, uh, you know, the response was really pretty quiet. Uh, but now I know the word is getting out there and uh, being received. So again, thank you. Um, I also wanted to mention that there'll be a link in the description below uh, to a video that Antonio Zamora just put out uh, yesterday, you know, at the time of this recording. So, uh, you know, and I've talked about him a few times in my previous segments, and uh, he really knows his stuff. So, uh, you know, for every view I get, he should be getting two or three. Uh, so go check it out. Um, and if you haven't seen parts one through four of this presentation yet, uh, you may want to go back and watch those first before moving on with this video. Um, now, uh, the next few parts, we'll be focusing on other forms of evidence uh, for the Saginaw Bay impact that eventually created the Carolina Bays. You know, an, an impact event that would have had or would have thrown stadium sized chunks of ice and slush halfway across the continent must have had other widespread and disastrous effects. And in fact, that's exactly what we find. You know, I touched on uh, these briefly at the end of part four. Uh, but now I want to look at each one of those a little bit closer uh, to help give us all a more complete picture. Uh, part five is going to focus on a thousand year stretch of our own history known as the Younger Dryas. <clears throat> uh, and I guess the first thing we, we need to do uh, is cover that a Dryas, uh, or more specifically the a Dryas octopatella, is nothing more than a subarctic flower. Um, these eight petaled flowers grow in cold, tundra-like conditions and were everywhere in Europe during the last ice age. Um, now, we know this mainly because of the pollen data taken from the Greenland ice cores. Uh, and this time frame with the abundant amount of driest pollen uh, has been termed the older driest. Um, as the temperatures gradually, gradually began to warm up at the end of the ice age, um, the conditions were less suitable for the driest flowers and its pollen became much less prevalent in the ice core data. Well, right at around 12,800 years ago, uh, the driest flower returned um, as the temperatures started to fall drastically and the glaciers began to uh, advance again. Now this return to the ice age lasted for the next thousand years or so and was named after this new pollen layer, the younger driest. Um, so, so what caused this sudden drop in temperatures uh, to invite the Ice Age to regain its grip on the globe? Uh, well, the scientifically accepted theory is that there was an interruption of the North Atlantic Ocean currents, more than likely caused by a sudden outflow of glacial meltwater from a huge lake known as Agassiz. Um, now, supposedly this lake would have been larger than all of the Great Lakes combined. And when the ice dams that were holding that water back broke, the icy water rushed into the North Atlantic, shutting down the Gulf Stream. Um, this is much like a scenario in the movie The Day After Tomorrow. Um, now, while the final result must be the same, the delivery method here had some major flaws. You know, first of all, we're talking about warming conditions, you know, so much warming that enough glacial ice melted to create a lake larger than all of the Great Lakes combined. Um, but we're supposed to believe that a few glacial ice dams were holding all of that water back. And there's, there's really no way. Um, you know, where were these ice dams subjected to separate physical laws <laughs> than the rest of the ice there? Um, no, you know, it's actually, it's, it's physically impossible for that much water to be collected in those global conditions. So what's the answer? You know, again, all the arrows point to a Saginaw Bay impact. Um, you know, I can easily see an impact that had enough energy to create the Carolina Bays to also be able to melt unimaginable quantities of glacial ice. You know, um, within just a few seconds after impact, you know, this entire area here, um, this entire area would have been one gigantic icy soup bowl of frigid glacial meltwater, huge icebergs, um, and boulders. Um, the erosive power of this torrent would have been unimaginable as the newly formed slurry rushed over the ice sheet and across the continent towards the sea. Um, you know, I may be stretching it a bit here and, you know, I'm no expert, but the Great Lakes themselves may have actually been created by this event. You know, perhaps 
not by the impact itself, but by the sudden erosive power of this glacial meltwater. Um, you know, once the icy water entered the North Atlantic, you know, it stopped the flow of the warm water of the Gulf of Mexico, uh, of the Gulf Stream, and uh, allowed for the thousand year extension of the Ice Age that we know as the Younger Dryas. And um, I'll get into more about the flooding evidence in, uh, in later videos. Um, but yeah, I could totally see this whole area just being one giant soup bowl of, you know, just a roast, uh, just a mess. And it had to, all that water had to go somewhere. Um, and you can kind of, you know, if you look at this Google Earth image, you know, you can kind of see where the water went, you know, up this way, across this way, um, you know, down into the Mississippi uh, River, you know, across the continent this way. So we'll, we'll get into some of these uh, flooding events uh, here in, an, in another video. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop there. Um, my next video will focus on the black mat layer uh, that corresponds with the Younger Dryas or the Saginaw Bay impact. Um, so, so as always, guys, feel free to leave a comment um, and help spread the word, you know, by sharing this video. Um, thanks again for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye.